Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Getting Technetical with Technetics. I'm your host, Tyler Kern. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the show. Now, on the previous episode, we talked a lot about the commercial aerospace space and uh, where that market was going, some of the factors that uh, that were contributing to it, and, uh, and previewed a little bit more for 2022. On this episode, we're going to be talking about the commercial space market and diving into that and some of the factors that are impacting that market as well. There is a ton of activity in the aerospace and defense market, so a lot to get into here in this episode of the show. And joining me for this episode once again is Jason Riggs, the Director of Strategy for the Americas at Technetics. Jason, welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on again, Tyler. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. So like I mentioned today, we are diving into the commercial space market. So Jason, let's kick things off right here. What are some of the trends you're seeing right now in the commercial space market? Uh, well, one of the trends that we continue to see play out is new entrants into the space, uh, both on the propulsion system side and the launch vehicle side. Um, with that, we're also seeing continued investments in those businesses, both through private funding, um, as well as through the pri uh, public markets, uh, particularly via SPACs. Um, some of the new players, uh, for instance, Ursa Major uh, has been around for a couple of years, just this week secured another $85 million, uh, in funding. Uh, Relativity Space, who develops uh, both rockets and propulsion systems, uh, they've already hit a valuation of well over $4 billion, and they've only been in business a few years. Uh, and with some of those, those businesses, we're also seeing um, a, a lot of progress being made in uh, different styles and types of manufacturing. So, for instance, uh, 3D printing um, for some companies, particularly people like Relativity Space, is really kind of core to their business, and we're seeing them really kind of start with 3D printing for flight structures, uh, propulsion components, et cetera. Um, the other, I, I would say, trend that we're really seeing with a lot of the commercial space players is uh, particularly folks like SpaceX and Blue Origin who have been at this a little bit longer. They're now reaching points in some of their designs where there's design stability. Um, they're not iterating as much on some of the more stable platforms. And that's also helping them to uh, create cost efficiencies. So, for instance, with uh, folks like SpaceX and Blue Origin, you know, if you go back 10 years ago, uh, they were using hardware that was kind of boutique-y, you know, one-off custom technology solutions, whereas now that things have stabilized, they're really kind of showing a preference for more standardized designs, in some cases, even more commercially off-the-shelf hardware, again, versus kind of those custom uh, one-off solutions. Uh, and, and I think really what's driving a lot of that is the desire to take cost out, but then also to ensure continuity of supply, especially as a lot of their supply base is shared with uh, the commercial aerospace market, which, as we discussed before, is really feeling a lot of the stress uh, and strain from the, the, the rebound uh, now that we're kind of moving out of the, the lulls of the pandemic last year. So one of the things that, that we've, we've certainly noticed has been an increased number of space launches. What is driving that increased number and, and maybe that rise that we're seeing right now? So there's a few factors at play. Um, certainly, you know, the, the need for nation states to uh, lift national security payloads into orbit uh, still remains strong. So most major nations are still putting uh, different types of national security payloads, and that can be anything from a spy satellite to uh, communication satellites to, uh, you know, satellites that are looking at uh, uh, the atmosphere and different environmental factors. Um, probably more significant in terms of volume of launches, I would say, is kind of our global hunger for uh, data and connectivity. Um, I, I recently read that uh, about just under 50 percent of global households in, in the world still don't have uh, access to the Internet. So there's, there's a massive problem to be solved there, and it appears that um, large satellite constellations providing Internet to those places is, is going to be the answer to that problem. Um, and a lot of that is really driven uh, by the fact that the cost and the size of these communication satellites has been drastically reduced, which is really enabling businesses to, to put more of those constellations in orbit. We're also seeing you know, uh, launch vehicles have become much more efficient. Uh, you know, you're seeing vehicles being reused by SpaceX, you know, 10 times now. And that certainly has brought the cost of uh, launch services down, uh, which for folks who are in the business of maybe building satellites or, you know, uh, operating constellations, but they don't have their own rockets like a Blue Origin or SpaceX, they can now hire a ride for a much more affordable price tag, which, again, makes makes operating those types of businesses much more uh, kind of commercially viable. 
Um, and there's quite a few people who fall into that category. Uh, you've got companies such as AST Space Mobile, which is a startup, and, and their model is to, to operate constellations where they're connecting uh, the satellites directly to a consumer smartphone, uh, kind of similar to what uh, you may recall with Iridium. Um, this week, another startup called Astronus announced a deal where they're going to be bringing satellite broadband to the country of Peru within two years. And then there's quite a few other players kind of in that same uh, category, Telesat, um, Airbus has a JV with OneWeb, um, Lockheed has a JV with OmniSpace, and of course, Amazon has their, their project Kuiper, uh, which is their effort to uh, create and operate constellations. And of course, most significantly, um, SpaceX's Starlink program um, is, is the one that's really out in front. To date, they've launched about 2,000 satellites, but their most recent uh, filing uh, with the FCC uh, requested uh, the ability to launch over 40,000 satellites for that constellation. So we expect a lot of growth ahead for that program. Um, and on a related note, uh, I read a report recently that, that noted that these space launch services, which includes everything from you know building the hardware to actually providing the launch, but that space launch service market is expected to grow at around a 13 to 14 percent CAGR, uh, putting the market size at over 26 billion by the year 2027. So there's a lot of growth ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, as we mentioned off the top, you know, uh, the, the commercial, uh, excuse me, the the aerospace and defense markets have certainly had a lot of activity, and there have been a lot of technological advancements that have really propelled the commercial space and the commercial market forward. What are some of the technology trends that you're seeing in the broader aerospace and defense markets? Yeah, so in those broader markets, um, both in, in aerospace and defense, uh, sustainability and ESG uh, are, are really kind of hot button issues, current priorities for both engine makers and airframers. Uh, and there's a lot of different uh, kind of schools of thought on how we can get to more sustainable flight. Um, one of those ideas is sustainable aviation fuels, which looks to be a, a relatively promising path forward. Um, just last week, actually, United flew a, a 737 MAX with passengers on 100% sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, that's the first time that's ever been done. So that shows some promise uh, kind of more in the near to intermediate term, kind of longer term. Um, there's hybrid electric aircraft that are being discussed, uh, primarily for the smaller class, maybe 150 seats and smaller. But you've got big players such as Rolls-Royce and GE for instance, that are looking at hybrid electric, electric solutions. Uh, there's, of course, hydrogen aircraft. I um, mean, you've got uh, big players like Airbus who are uh, really making some, some good progress there. Uh, and then, of course, there's also supersonic aircraft, which some argue is, is also kind of falls into the, um, the bucket of sustainability. Uh, I recently heard the CEO of uh, Boom Supersonic, who's the key player there, kind of make his, uh, his pitch for why this is a more... Uh, efficient and sustainable method of travel. And it, it's a very interesting pitch. Uh, they have very interesting technology and it appears they've got a really solid business plan. So we may be uh, at the cusp of re-entering um, supersonic uh, travel again. And then of course, uh, separate from that, we've got the all electric aircraft makers. Uh, that's certainly a trend that continues. You know, that's going to be more your smaller quadcopter, uh, you know, kind of helicopter replacements. And you've got startups such as Joby who are making a lot of uh, progress and even players such as Embraer. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of technology advancements and kind of shifts in the market, um, certainly we would want to mention some hypersonic missiles. Um, for, for those who aren't maybe familiar with that technology, you're talking about uh, missiles that travel at about five times the speed of sound, uh, which means they cover about a mile per second. Um, these weapons are able to deliver both conventional and nuclear payloads anywhere in the world within literally minutes. Um, so we are certainly entering a new arms race, really being uh, kind of led by the U.S., Russia, and China. And here in the U.S., uh, contractors such as Lockheed and Raytheon are really at the forefront of developing that technology. Um, and it's interesting because the, uh, the hypersonic vehicles themselves are, are certainly out and about. We've seen uh, media reports about the uh, countries like China testing recently. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S.'s current defenses may or may not be sufficient to uh, kind of protect against these, these hypersonic weapons. So, so that's a big air focus, particularly for the defense complex. Um, 
there's a lot of opportunities there for uh, contractors to kind of help advance that uh, that state of the art. And certainly it is a race. This is a very time sensitive uh, matter for those in the defense, defense complex. So, Jason, as we uh, begin to wrap up our conversation today, just talking about the space market and the space industry in general, covering a lot of different aspects of this. Do you have any closing thoughts, anything you want to leave us with here today uh, and leave the listeners with uh, in terms of the, the space market heading into 2022? Yeah, so as we think about the commercial space market, um, we know that market's going to continue to grow and evolve very quickly, as it always has. Uh, Technetics has been heavily involved in the commercial space market uh, since the onset, and we're confident that we'll continue to grow as that market grows and evolves. Uh, we're also excited about the technology advancements that we're seeing in the broader aerospace and defense market. Um, our goal is really to develop and acquire technologies that will allow us to to help drive these markets forward, not just chase them. Um, and we feel really good about where Technetics and, uh, and, and NPRO at large are positioned uh, to be able to support these markets as they continue to grow and evolve. Excellent stuff. Jason Riggs, Director of Strategy for the Americas at Technetics. Jason, thank you again so much for joining us here on this episode of Getting Technetical with Technetics. Thank you, Tyler. It was a pleasure. And everyone out there, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Getting Technetical with Technetics. We appreciate it very much. Of course, for more, you can visit the Technetics website and reach out to people like Jason if you have questions, if you want to learn more about the work that Technetics is doing in these areas and stay up to date with the latest in uh, in aerospace and space markets and things along those lines. Of course, you should subscribe to the podcast as well at Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And stay tuned. We'll be back soon with new episodes of the show. But for this one, for my guest today, Jason Riggs, I've been your host, Tyler Kern. Thanks for joining us.